You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast, and I have Alex Abramson. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, an ingestible self-orienting system for the oral delivery of macromolecules, which sounds really interesting. So, Alex, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. So, let's be kind of what, what uh, I just said. What, what are you working on in your words? And uh, then we'll ask questions about it. Yeah, so it's a new pill for the oral delivery, oral delivery of insulin and other biologic drugs. So what it does is you swallow it, and it actually delivers a tiny injection into the stomach wall instead of having to deliver an injection into your side. Oh, so you swallow it, it travels to your stomach, and then what the acid activates it, and it stabs you in the side of the stomach and releases the pill, or how does it work? I wouldn't say it stabs you in the side of the stomach. Uh, what happens is Sorry, that the pill... In general. Yeah, Yes, the, the pill, you swallow it, and it lands at the bottom of the stomach. It orients itself so that it's facing in the direction of the tissue wall, and it inserts a drug-loaded post directly into the stomach tissue. That post then dissolves and allows for systemic uptake, which is comparable to subcutaneous injection. So what, why is there a, a need for this, I guess, to avoid sticking yourself? But are there other reasons you'd make such a thing? Yeah, there are actually a lot of reasons. But first and foremost, people don't really like needles. And there's just this general aversion towards needles. There's a stigma against it that has been set out pretty much since the invention of the needle. Nobody likes going to the doctor and getting a vaccine. But there's there's a lot of other reasons as well. I mean, first of all, it's painful. Uh, it causes the generation of biohazardous needle waste, and it requires a trained professional. Uh, also, when you have a needle-based injection, you need to inject a liquid dose, and that requires refrigeration, whereas our pill is a solid dose, and you could put it in your pocket, carry it around for months, and it, the drug would remain stable. Oh, wow. A lot of reasons. I didn't even think about all those reasons. That's interesting. What yeah. about, um, I, I mean, people have been stuck so many times, but depending on the condition or the substance being injected, if you're going to do an injection, what kind of local like microenvironment changes happen, you know, because of the needle shaft going through tissue and being pulled out and being pushed in? That's a great question. I mean, obviously there's some tissue damage that occurs, uh, but people have really created needles you know, for a long time. And the needles that are being used, even in subcutaneous injections and intramuscular injections, are so small that the amount of tissue damage is really negligible. And when you clean the, the site before injection, it ensures that there isn't anything being introduced into the site as well. With our injection in the stomach, so our pill that delivers the drug to the tissue wall, uh, it's also a very small needle. It's about a millimeter uh, in diameter. And additionally, the stomach tissue regenerates extremely quickly. And so what we've, we've done is we've fed these devices to large animal models, and we've gone back 24 hours and a week later to look at what the tissue was reacting, and we actually we didn't see anything. It's almost impossible to even see where the device landed in the first place and delivered that drug. Well, how do you know it got to the right spot? And again, how do you make it survive to just the right spot where it's going to uh, be able to you know, deploy its uh, tiny needle on it here? Yes, yeah, so the, the pill is incredibly robust in its ability to deliver an injection. Because it self-orients, it can be in any sort of environment in the stomach. You can be standing upside down, and the device will orient itself so it's in the direction of the tissue wall. You can be standing up right side up, and it would land at the bottom of the stomach, self-orient, and insert the drug into the tissue wall. And that has to do with both the shape and the density distribution of the pill. The pill has a weighted bottom, and it also has a very high curvature upper portion, very similar actually to the shape of a tortoise, the leopard tortoise in particular, which is what we modeled this mm. pill after. Uh, and so 
The leopard tortoise is, is well known for being able to turn itself over when it's on its back. Uh, the same with many turtles and tortoises out there. Uh, but the leopard tortoise is particularly optimized for the self-orientation. And so using that idea of a low center of mass and a high curvature upper portion, the device is only stable in one configuration. You must have had a, a, a night of many dreams when you invented this thing. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's pretty how, how cool. Did, uh, how did you come up with this? You know, I'm, I'm just joking that you had like a fever dream and thought of it, but how did you come up with it? Yeah, so the, the idea that we had was to use a needle injection to deliver macromolecules in the gut. Uh, and the very first thing that I tried was covering the entire pill with needles, right? The whole circumference of the pill with needles. And I, I dropped it on a piece of tissue. And I realized that only about a quarter of those needles were actually making contact with the tissue wall. The other three quarters were pointed up into the air or to the side. And if that was in the stomach, the stomach acid would attack and degrade any of the drug that was released out of the tissue and not into the tissue. And so I thought, what's a, a way that we can put those needles only on one side of the pill and ensure that the, the side of the pill with the needles on it would always be facing towards the tissue wall? And, uh, you know, I mean, I think everybody has thought about the idea of a, a turtle or a tortoise writing itself after it's been put on its back. Um, but, you know, I, I Googled self-orienting things. And uh, the first thing that came up was actually the, the Weeble Wobble toy. Uh, it's, this, it's this fun toy, I think, that a lot of people have seen. Uh, and then the second result on Google was this, was this great paper about um, the mathematics of the self-orienting of turtles. It was by this guy over in Budapest, Hungary, this really great mathematician. And he had done a huge amount of research on the shape of tortoises and turtles and uh, their density distributions that allow them to orient themselves. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. And we used the initial guess of a tortoise shell for our device, and then we optimized it specifically for the environment of the stomach. That's really cool. Huh. So it orients itself, and then what, a coating wears away because of the stomach acid and it exposes a needle or multiple needles, or what does it look like? So when you swallow the drug, it lands at the bottom of the stomach, and there's a hydration-based actuator. The pill senses the humidity of the stomach. If we used acid to trigger the device, some people have a different acidity content in their stomach. For example, uh, what if you took a, a, a cough drop? Oh, an antacid. Or an yeah. antacid, okay. exactly, right, before you wanted to take this pill. Or if you drank a glass of milk, even, or if you drank a glass of orange juice, you'd have a more acidic stomach than usual. So acidity, while one thinks of the stomach as being a, a highly acidic environment, it, it ranges, it varies between one and four in different people. And so that's not the best trigger for this particular mechanism. Uh, so instead we use hydration and everybody's stomach is humid. The inside of the body is a 100% humidity environment. And so once you swallow this pill, the time begins ticking. And we give the pill five minutes to land at the bottom of the stomach. Esophageal transit time in a human is normally on the order of about five seconds, but in some people it can range up to a minute. Uh, and so by giving the pill five minutes until it actuates, we make sure that the person has had time to swallow the pill and for it to land in the stomach, but not long enough of a time for it to actuate in the small intestine. Well, what's, um, what if uh, you got the pill in your pocket, like you said, and it's really humid outside or you're sweating next to the pill or something and then, you know, the timer runs out or close to run out and then you swallow it and it goes, you know, in the wrong place. Another great question. Uh, you can keep the pill in a blister pack so there's no humidity. And the pill is perfectly fine in an environment up to 40 degrees C. Okay. Makes sense. Hmm. I guess, you know, some climates may be super humid, but um, you can only do so much. So blister pack makes sense. High hum humidity threshold makes sense and all that. Interesting. Huh. What, what, um, so what happens to the pill? So it's, it, how long does it take to uh, inject its payload? And then what happens to the the skin or the outer part of the pill, does that dissolve away in a given period of time or how does it work? The pill is made up of two components. One of them is that drug-loaded post and the other one is the device and actuation mechanism. The drug-loaded post, after it's injected, after, after that five-minute period, uh, that is made completely of biodegradable materials and our drug that we want to deliver. The very tip of the post is made out of nearly 100% drug. Uh, in the case of our paper that we 
uh, we published, we used insulin as a model drug, but it really could be any drug. It could be monoclonal antibodies. It could be nucleic acids. And that very tip of the post that we're delivering, that is the part that goes into the tissue. Nothing else goes into the tissue. Uh, and that part dissolves over the course of hours or minutes, depending on what kind of excipient we add into the post. Uh, so you can imagine if you add something that takes in a lot of water, then the drug is going to dissolve much faster. But if you add something that extends the release of the drug, then you could make it dissolve over a significantly longer period of time. The shaft of the, of the drug post is made out of a biodegradable material, and so that degrades within minutes. Uh, and the shell itself, the part that's used for self-orienting and actuating of the device and actually inserting that needle, we use a compressed spring to insert the needle. And so that compressed spring and the shell itself is small enough that it passes through the body without any issue. There's a lot of non-degradable objects that people swallow for therapy. Uh, one example is the Oros capsule. It's an osmotic pump. That's approved by the FDA for daily dosing of drugs for ADHD medication. Uh, and our pill is actually smaller than that, that pill that's non-degradable and approved by the FDA. That's amazing. I, I can see you have a ton of work ahead of you, but you can do really cool stuff. You can make sure drugs get delivered only to the stomach. Um, you can probably shape and have concentric levels of drugs in the, um, in the post, you know, the outside one degrades at a certain rate, and then it reveals the inside one, which then, you know, enters. I mean, you could do all kinds of different geometries, you know, of the delivery itself. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really exciting. But I think the most exciting thing about it is that it could potentially replace all subcutaneous injections. Uh, you know, I think that that's really exciting, especially for people with diabetes or people with rheumatoid arthritis who are taking monoclonal antibodies for their medications as well. Well, I guess there are some injections that do need to stay local. You know, they don't all go through the stomach necessarily, but besides those, I'm sure most of them act systemically, so this would be an easier way to do something like that. Yeah, that's true. So what, um, has there been a lot of excitement, you know, from uh, drug drug makers, or like what's, uh, what stage is the project at? There's been a ton of excitement. This project was actually uh, funded significantly by Novo Nordisk Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Novo Nordisk, they, they sponsored our project here at MIT, and we've been working with them extremely closely uh, over the past four years, since 2015, in order to get this project ready for publication. And now that we've published it, we've actually uh, we've done quite a few different studies in multiple large animal models. And we're looking forward to bringing it into clinical trials within the next three years. So the first goal is what, for insulin delivery, or what's going to be the first trial? Insulin may not be the best choice for a uh, first drug, just because it has a very small therapeutic window. We're exploring lots of different options. Okay. Um, any unintended or unanticipated things you've discovered in the making and, uh, of this thing that uh, you, know, you didn't know at first that surprised you? Yeah, something that was really interesting was when we were looking at the studies on the penetration of stomach tissue. We thought that it was going to be very difficult for us to insert into the stomach tissue without perforating it. But what we found was that the muscle layer on the end of the stomach tissue, right? So there's several different layers of, of the stomach tissue. There's this mucosa layer, then there's a submucosa layer, and then there's a muscular layer. And that outer muscular layer is extremely thick. And so we pounded that muscular layer during ex vivo tests. We went up four times the amount of force that was required to deliver sub submucosally. And we still weren't able to penetrate through that muscular layer of stomach tissue. And so this layer of tissue is really a natural barrier that we didn't even think about initially for preventing the perforation of the tissue during our injection with this device. So what did you do to overcome it? Was it a geometry issue or was it a force issue? Uh, well, actually, we, we don't need to overcome it because we didn't want to go through that muscular layer. It prevents the problem of perforation. One of the, the big issues with injecting oh, okay, okay. into the Sorry. stomach is that you don't want to go all the way through, right? That could release stomach acid into the rest of your body, and it could be a huge issue, something that could require hospitalization. Uh, but because there's this natural okay. barrier in place and it provides a significantly um, higher amount of force than, um, than you know, we can even deliver using our device, there's no issue of this perforation. What about pills that are currently swallowed normally? 
if it instead was delivered through, you know, your self-orienting pill, would it somehow deliver better? Uh, would it deliver at a, a different time rate? I mean, what's it was? It's, I bet you there's advantages for anything you swallow. One thing that could be interesting to look at are poorly soluble drugs, so drugs that aren't taken up very easily by the small intestine because they don't dissolve well in the uh, in the gastric environment, uh, or drugs that just aren't taken up through the tissue very well. Those could be excellent candidates for delivery using our device. What happens if um, you have someone that's on, I don't know, 10 different medications and they just want to like swallow them all at once? And what if more than one of them are your type of pill? Or if yours is the only one and the others are just regular pills, I guess it won't affect it. But is there a situation where people would swallow multiple of these? As I mentioned before, the self-orienting nature of the pill is incredibly robust. And we've actually tested what would happen if you delivered six pills at once. All of the devices still self-orient. And then we've tested what would happen if a person were to lean to the side a little bit if they had just taken that pill. And because the pill... Uh, it has a very high curvature upper portion, but it has a flat bottom, and that flat bottom prevents it from tilting uh, when a person were to lean from side to side, and that keeps the preferred orientation always facing towards the tissue wall. Huh. Very, very cool. Um, any issues if someone has slow stomach emptying? I think they call it gastroparesis or something. Because this targets the stomach rather than the small intestine, there's not an issue with gastroparesis as long as there isn't large food particles still in the stomach. Uh, If there were large food particles in the stomach, this particular device can't work uh, because when it landed at the bottom of the stomach, it would land on food instead of landing on the tissue. Mm, Okay. So there are certain meals that you should avoid or always take this before you eat and then leave a window of five minutes? Exactly. Yes. If you take it before you eat, leave a window of five minutes to allow the device to inject, then you can eat whatever you want and there wouldn't be an issue. Is there a way for the, um, or is there a need for the device to communicate, let's say to a receiver, to let you know, okay, it's landed and it's, you know, it's, it's in position? Would that be helpful or not necessarily? It's something that we've thought about. Uh, we haven't shown any work uh, publicly that we've been able to do that, and, but it's something that we're thinking about. Okay. I appreciate you being really open about this. I'm sure, you know, there's so much proprietary stuff. So uh, anything you can't answer, you know, no harm, no foul, but... Uh, I just figured I'd ask. So, but you've been really great with with details so far. Yeah, sure. I mean, we have this this paper out there because we want to be totally open about what's going on with this device and have a lot of people look at it and say, "Oh, you know, maybe this could be an issue." And and we'd like to hear that. Any feedback you've gotten on things that you think could be a challenge, or you know, what's the feedback been from uh, you know outside parties? Everybody's really excited. There's definitely some challenges though that we have to look at. One in particular is what happens if this pill is delivered chronically over the course of years. Uh, we delivered the pill once and we didn't see any issue with uh, delivery to the, to the stomach in terms of fibrosis or anything like that. But if the pill was constantly delivering at the exact same spot in the stomach over and over and over again, could that cause any potential issues? And, and that's something that we're uh, taking very seriously and we're looking into some large animal studies on that. And what's your background? I mean, you know, it sounds like you're pretty knowledgeable about this. Did you come from a background that was, you know, in drug discovery or in uh, in any of these areas, or did you figure it out on your own? I'm a PhD candidate in chemical engineering, uh, so I've been working on this project since its inception in, in 2015, but I didn't come from any uh, background that was, su- like, significantly in, in health. I did my undergraduate at Johns Hopkins uh, in chemical engineering as well, and, and I worked in another lab that also did gastrointestinal devices. Uh, but, I mean, I, I, w- I don't think that that qualifies me to be an expert. But our, um, our, our co-corresponding author and co-principal investigator on this project, Giovanni Traverso, he's a gastrointestinal doctor, uh, a gastroenterologist, and he has extensive knowledge about the gastrointestinal tract and what is and isn't okay to do. Okay, very good. Um, again, I'm sure you have your hands full with this, but is there any time or even consideration to other devices that would go further before they would um, they would implant anything into the you know intestines, large intestine, or is that uh, again there's so much to do with this project that's not even on the radar? Absolutely, we have interest in in targeting all the different organs of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, each one provides different positives and negatives. Uh, one of the issues with delivering to the small intestine rather than the stomach is that the small intestine has thinner walls. And so if you're delivering a microneedle 
to the small intestine, you're much more likely to perforate it than you are if you're delivering to the stomach. And that requires that you use smaller needles. Uh, so that mitigates the amount of drug that you can deliver. Additionally, you mentioned gastroparesis before. Uh, and a person who was experiencing gastroparesis, that pill that you swallow, you would have an unknown amount of time between transferring from the stomach to the small intestine. Uh, those are all things that can be overcome, but there are significant challenges in the delivery to the small intestine in particular. However, the small intestine is great at absorbing molecules. It's highly vascularized and there's a lot of surface area. So the small intestine is a, a really ideal place to deliver it, even though it has those challenges. All right. So what's the path forward? You said it's going to take several years for clinical trials, at least. Um, what do you see is happening in the next you know, year or so? What's coming? What we want to do is we want to make sure that it's as safe as possible before we go into clinical trials. Uh, so we've been doing some tests on ex vivo human tissue, and we're doing more tests on large animal models. Uh, these are all things that are going to be crucial to making sure that we have a safe and efficacious product before we actually go into humans. When do you think it's possible that uh, people will start using such a device? How long? So as we said, the clinical trials we expect will happen in about three years. But then because this is a drug device combination, it's going to need to go through the first, second, and third phase of clinical trials. Any fast track opportunities? Not that I know of, but it's very possible that that could happen. Yeah, I heard, you know, Japan is uh, is big on fast tracking certain kinds of um, certain devices. So that's why I just you know, thought of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we what is the most important thing to us is that, you know, that this is going to improve the lives of patients and that it's going to be safe when it does it. Right. Yeah. Well, very good. So how can uh, people find out more about the device and, uh, you know, uh, maybe get in contact if they have questions? Yeah, uh, I mean, you can feel free to email uh, any of us on the on the paper. There's there's quite a few different people on this paper. It was a, a big collaboration, collaborative effort between MIT and Nova Nordisk. And the the email addresses of the corresponding authors, Robert Langer and Giovanni Traverso, are are on the paper. Uh, you can reach me as well. My my email address is on the Langer Lab website. And uh, we have a great YouTube video that we've put out too. It, if you look up Giovanni Traverso on YouTube and uh, click on the self-orienting millimeter scale applicator video. We have an excellent video that describes exactly what the device does. Oh, very cool. Okay. That's great resources. Well, Alex, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. And um, you know, it sounds like this would be a really, really fantastic device once it's ready. Yeah, we're really excited, not just for its ability to disrupt the insulin market, but really all you know, biologic drugs. I mean, particularly monoclonal antibodies and the up and coming nucleic acid market. Well, very good. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now and the companies that are using these technologies for the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, Please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.